good morning. Great joy to be with you. Uh, trust uh, you've already been tasting and seeing the goodness of the Lord as he bestows his love on us in the gift of gathered worship this morning. If you're new with us today, we're, you're here at the perfect time. We're beginning a brand new series. It's going through January on the gift of God's grace to us in the sacraments. Now, sacraments are, uh, that's a word which may not be familiar for uh, a lot of folks. Uh, they go, well, I'm not sure where I find that word even in the Bible. Uh, but our English word sacrament is from a Latin word, sacramentum, and that is uh, from the Latin translation of the Greek New Testament. And here's the Greek word that's used all over the New Testament. It's the word mystery, mystery. So our task over the next month is to explain the mysteries of God. Excellent. I'll just go sit down now. <laughs> the mysteries. In other words, but here's the thing about biblical mystery. In, in biblical mystery, God comes to his people and by these physical means, bread, wine, water, reveals amazing truth to us and confers and conveys to us his grace. That's what's in view today. And in particular, when it comes to the sacraments, we acknowledge that Jesus has given two very visible rites permanently to his church, and that these are holy baptism, which we've already celebrated uh, this morning, and the sacrament of the Lord's table, uh, which we will begin to celebrate every Sunday together, uh, beginning the first Sunday in February, but which we already celebrate frequently together. But we're going to dig down deep. We're going to do some sustained teaching on this issue so that we understand it. We're going to start off today looking at holy baptism. Now, to do that, we're going to start in Deuteronomy. I'm going to read a few passages of Scripture for you today, one from Deuteronomy, one from Acts 2, and then uh, one from Romans chapter 6. And today we're going to talk about holy baptism the, the meaning of baptism, the mode of baptism, and the message of baptism. Baptism, of course, is one of those completely non-controversial subjects in the church. No, everybody's just totally unified on it. A, a, a couple of guys were really good friends, a Baptist minister, an Episcopalian minister, and they decided to have a friendly debate in front of their congregations about baptism, but they decided to confine themselves only to Bible verses. They could only read Bible verses. And uh, they flipped a coin, the Episcopalian went first, and he got up and read, let the children come unto me and forbid them not, and sat down. And then the Baptist minister got up and read, Og, king of Bashan, and all of his hordes. And um, he looked at him and said, what's that got to do with baptism? And the Baptist minister said, about as much as yours did. And so um, <laughs> there's, this, there's this kind of unfriendly, friendly thing going on, but hopefully some of that we can, um, let's just say this, perhaps we can calm the waters or trouble them as the Lord may have in mind. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7, uh, remembering sacraments, God's signs and seals of his covenant for us. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all people. It is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand years generations. God is the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God, and he makes his covenant and keeps it to a thousand generations. Acts 2, verses 38 and 39, day of Pentecost, Peter's preached his sermon, and people are stricken in their hearts. They want to believe in Jesus. What do we do, they cry out. And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord shall call to himself. And then finally, in Romans chapter 6, let me read to you, uh, beginning in verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized 
into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self uh, was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. This is the word of the Lord. So um, some of you know my story. Some of you won't. I grew up in the Lutheran church, uh, baptized, catechized, confirmed in the uh, Lutheran church, what's now the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, Elko, when I was in my mid-teens, parents switched over to another Lutheran denomination, but that's where I grew up. So I was baptized as a baby. Uh, they brought, I was born on a Sunday morning, just in time for Sunday school, and um, a week, <laughs> I was, and a week later, a week later, uh, I was brought into church and they baptized me, thank God, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, setting me apart as a member of the visible church of Jesus Christ, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, the faith of my parents who, uh, who, who recognize that uh, children are a, the gift and blessing of the Lord and children are part of the covenant community. I was raised in that, and, um, but I, I, in my mid-teens, I grew very uncomfortable and unhappy with that understanding of baptism. And I remember um, a person who, who was a Lutheran minister giving me a theology book, and under baptism, I looked it up and it said, it said we cannot find a scriptural reason for infant baptism. Well, that was pretty much all I needed. And went, well, you know, I thought we were supposed to be standing on Scripture, and if you can't give me a good biblical reason, then I'm out of here. And so I rejected all of that, and I uh, moved over uh, into believing against infant baptism. Uh, and uh, um, this was, you know, uh, sort of a, a long journey that, um, uh, you know, I was for leading uh, churches that only practiced believers' baptism, charismatic churches, for about 20 years. Um, then... Uh, in the process of being a parent, how many of you found out that being a parent changes you, right? Like, like, you know, Jesus changes you and then your kids change you, right? And, and so we were looking at the issue of education. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not bothered about baptism. I know what I believe about baptism. And, uh, I, but I got to look at the issue of education. How do you educate your children? And I began, so I'm going to study the Bible. I'm going to study the Bible about education. I'm going to study the Bible about children. I want to know what the Bible says about children. And all of a sudden, as I got tucked into the Bible on children, I began to discover a biblical view of children, particularly a biblical view of children being in the covenant community. And that became a game changer for me. Because what I want to invite you to do with me this morning is not just think about the Bible, but think biblically about the Bible. Now, see, that's one of the things that we fail to do. What we do as post-enlightenment Western people is we take our categories of thought into the Bible, and when you and I think, we think as individuals. We do very individualistic ways of approaching problems. But that's not the way Near Eastern people approached issues. They approached them covenantally, not just individualistically. They didn't think just in terms of the decision of an individual. They thought about covenant and households. And in fact, we're just not as mindful of it today because we don't spend as much time reading those genealogies in the Bible. You know those chapters in the Bible where you come to and you have just name after name after name after name and you're like, oh, I've got to skip ahead in my through the Bible in a Year reading program here. This is a, right up there with Leviticus and washing kidneys. Can I just skip over this, please? <laughs> right? And so you just name after name. You're like, ah. Oh. But actually, actually, those lists of names are the skeletal system of the entire biblical revelation. Because that list of names is how God has promised from the beginning of time, going all the way back to the original promise to send a Savior through the seed of the woman, God has promised through His covenant through successive generations to fulfill his promise. And so children, children are part of his covenant promise and part of who God is to us as the faithful God who keeps his covenant. That's why in Deuteronomy 7 it says that God is the God who establishes covenant and keeps his covenant to how many generations? 
A thousand generations. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're in generation 1001, God looks at you and goes, up, oh, you're out. That's not what that means. A thousand is a biblical way of saying forever. God will never break his covenant. God is the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. And when God makes a covenant, he never makes it with just an individual. Never. He always makes it with a head and all those who succeed onwards from that covenant head. And so when God makes a covenant with Adam, it's with Adam and all who are in Adam. It's with Noah and everyone who's in Noah. It's with Abraham and everyone who's in Abraham. And whenever God gives a covenant, listen to this, he gives a sign of the covenant. Here's the sign of the covenant. To Noah, what was it? It's a rainbow. To Abraham, it was the covenant of circumcision. And throughout those generations, the sign of the covenant was given. Even though many people weren't faithful to the covenant, God never broke it. God kept his promise even when people didn't. And they kept placing that sign on them, knowing that ultimately the promise of God will be fulfilled. Well, you know, the interesting thing is when you turn to the New Testament, it says we have a better covenant with better promises. How can a better covenant with better promises not include the children? That, that's not possible. In fact, it says in Acts chapter 2, as I just read to you this morning, Acts 2, 38 and 39, when Peter made that massive invitation in Jerusalem on the uh, day of Pentecost, he said, he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit because the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off as many as God shall call to himself. And so in the New Testament we read not just about individuals being baptized, though we certainly read about that, but we read too about whole households being baptized. Household baptism. I've had the privilege of, of doing that on a few occasions where you baptize every member of the household. Let me remind you again of 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Paul talks about in a, in a marriage where there's a Christian, where, where there's at least one believing parent, he says the child, listen to Paul's words, 1 Corinthians 7, 14, is called holy. Now that doesn't mean holy in behavior. It means they're set apart. They're marked. They're part of God's people. When Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, to the saints, he gets to the end of it and he says, and children, children, he includes the children among the saints. Well, what's the mark in the New Testament? What is the visible sign of membership in the covenant community? There was only ever one, holy baptism. We know that whole households were baptized, and we know that children were baptized because that's exactly how they're treated. And circumcision in Colossians 2 is directly connected with holy baptism. That sign is transferred. And the blood rite becomes a water rite. And the moment of change on that from blood to water happened on the cross. When Jesus hung on the cross and he died for our sins, that was the last time that blood ever had to be shed. And when they opened up his side, out flowed blood and water. And the blood was done and the water began to flow. And ever since that time, water has been applied as a sign of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ, as a visible sign of who are the members of the covenant community. This has always been true of our children. In Isaiah chapter 40, it says, The Lord is the shepherd who gathers the lambs in his arm, and he carries the nursing ewes with him. So there are no children left out. Now, there are people who want to leave out the children. When Moses was in front of Pharaoh... Uh, saying, let my people go. Pharaoh on one occasion said, you can go, but leave your children here. And Moses said, no, we're not leaving the kids out. Pharaoh said, well, then you can't go. Moses said, we're not going without our children. Children are part of the covenant community. They're part of the worshiping community. The sign of the covenant is upon them. Well, somebody says, well, that's just deduction. That's just, a, you're just deducing. You can't really show me a verse that says, that says babies got baptized. Well, actually, 1 Corinthians 10 does, says, does say that uh, uh, babies were baptized because it says that all the people of Israel were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and there, there were babies in that crowd. But, but when you say, I gotta have a verse for it, let me remind you that you're all doing, you're all doing theological deduction because you don't have a verse for women taking communion. Just saying. <laughs> but you're going, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. 
I think women are at the Lord's table. We don't have a specific verse, but what do you have? We say, well, well, the whole church is there, and that includes women. No kidding! And it includes children, and it includes infants. They're part of the covenant community. That's theological deduction. It's work that every single one of us have to do. So what do we know about baptism? I just wanted to lay that out there for children. You don't have to believe in infant baptism to be a member of this church. You do have to believe in it to be an officer in this church, but you don't have to believe in it to be a member of the church. But I do want you to understand that that, that when God makes his covenant, he makes it across the generations. But whether you believe in it or not, what's baptism all about? Well, let me talk to you about its meaning, its mode, and its message. Well, in its meaning, look at Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 7. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? That's Romans chapter 3. Let me tell you two things about the meaning of baptism. The first one is this, union with Christ. Union with Christ. In Matthew 28, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name. Our English translations say, in the name. And that can kind of sound like the, by the authority of. Like, stop in the name of the law. But it's in the name, it's literally into the name. To be baptized means this. In the ancient world, baptism meant that you were joined to another. That's union. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, talking about the people of Israel, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So the very first thing that we know about baptism is that baptism is a sign of our being united to Jesus. It means that an old life has come to an end and a new life has begun. You've been joined to another. You've been baptized into Christ. And Paul goes on to say here, if you're buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. If we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So in other words, what happens in baptism is this. You are united to Jesus, and listen to this, in holy baptism, his story becomes your story. On the cross, our story became his. Our story of sin became his, and he died and paid the penalty of that sin. In holy baptism, His story of death and resurrection becomes ours. We have new life in Jesus Christ. And baptism is a sign of that new life. Here's the second thing that's a sign of baptism. Cleansing. Water is a cleansing agent. And it signifies the blood of Jesus cleansing us from all sin. In Acts 22, 16, um, Paul, uh, talking about his own testimony, says that the, that, that the man who baptized him said, Paul, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. The word baptize in the Bible is always associated with cleansing. Uh, it shows up this way even when baptism itself is not in view. Let me give you a verse. Those of you who are taking notes can write this down, both of you. Um, Luke... <laughs> <laughs> Luke, 11, Luke 11, 38. In Luke eleven thirty eight. 38, there's a Pharisee who's mad at Jesus because Jesus didn't wash his hands before dinner. And he says, he says, you didn't cleanse your hands. You didn't wash your hands before dinner. And, and the word that's used there in Luke eleven thirty eight 38 for cleansing, washing, is the word baptize. Now, how, by the way, how, how did that baptism work, by the way? Pouring pouring water over his hands. So when somebody says, well, baptize automatically means immerse, and I'll get to more on that in a second. No, it doesn't. It can mean, it can mean pouring. In Luke eleven thirty-eight, 38, that's exactly what it means. That's how they cleansed their hands, held out their hands, and they poured water over it. And that's baptism. But it's about cleansing. So it's about being united to Christ, and it's about being cleansed from your sins. And we just know this. There's a beautiful moment in Brother, Where Art Thou?, <laughs> if you haven't seen it, man, you need to see it, right? And, and Delmar, he gets it, man. There's a big baptism service going on down at the river, and he sees the people getting baptized. He runs over there, and the preacher baptizes him, and there must have been something in the water. And Delmar comes leaping up, I'm saved, I'm cleansed. All my sins are washed away. Even the piggly wiggly I knocked over in Yazoo City. 
And he said, and, 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 uh, and uh, said back to him, um, you said, you said uh, those charges were false. And he goes, uh, well, that was a lie. And I'm cleansed of that too. <laughs> Baptism is a sign, and it's a permanent sign in our lives, that the blood of Jesus is efficacious to the taking away of all of our sins, even if you knocked over a piggly wiggly in Yazoo City. Here's the second thing I want to talk to you about, the mode of baptism, the mode of baptism. Look at Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Don't you know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, by him or with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So there's the word baptized. Now, one of the things that my friends who want to insist on it being immersion, which I always insisted on too, uh, saying it, you know, that's the only possible way to do baptism, is that the Greek word, uh, Greek verb bapto uh, means to dip or to immerse. Well, it can mean that. Uh, or baptizo, to cause to be dipped or to cause to be immersed. It can mean that, and it is used that way. There are three modes of baptism which are really represented in the Bible and in the New Testament especially. Uh, immersion, pouring, and sprinkling. And let me talk to you about all, all, all of those for just a second. Um, the word bapto, baptizo, that group of words, doesn't always mean to immerse, though it can. And a good example of where it can is the leper Naaman. In the Greek version of the Old Testament where Naaman the leper is told to go dip himself in the Jordan River and he goes down six times and nothing happens but on the seventh time he comes up and all of the leprosy is gone. Wonderful story. So he is immersed in the, in the River Jordan. Wonderful example of that. Um, baptism by immersion, that's fine. But I, I want to caution you on it because a lot, a lot of times I hear people say, well, that's the only way to do it because that's what burial looks like. You go down in burial and then you're raised up. And that's what Paul's talking about here. That sounds great except that that's not how people were buried. That's not how they were buried in, 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 in that era and in this part of the world. That's not how they buried people. They didn't bury them in the ground. If you were Roman, they burned your body. That's number one. So number two, if you're buried, that was a Hebrew tradition. They didn't bury you in the ground. They buried you in a cave. So if you want to get baptized, you got, we got to kind of slide you through the water, <laughs> kind of like this, whew, whew, real fast, you know. And it's not about going down and coming up because the way they buried people was by putting them in caves. Don't want to be a gr bit grim with you, but the bodies would decompose and they collect up the bones and put them in bone boxes. And those are regularly discovered by archaeologists. So they weren't buried in the ground, they were buried in caves. So going down and coming up, that's not what that word's about at all. Just going to say that, Okay. Just got to, had to get my highlighter out of that. But there's nothing wrong with immersion. That's just fine. No worries. That's just the way that goes. Uh, but I want us to be clear about uh, that it's, uh, it's perfectly acceptable. That's, it's how it's used in the Bible. But uh, that's not the only way it's used. It's also used by pouring. As I already mentioned, Luke eleven thirty eight. 38. But then specifically in connection with being baptized, in Acts, Jesus says, to his disciples, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now, Acts chapter 1. And then in Acts chapter 2, when that baptism with the Spirit occurs, Peter's explaining it and he says, he says, God has poured out this, which you see in here, the work of the Spirit. He's poured it out. So baptism can mean immersion and it's also used as pouring. And then you say, yeah, but sprinkling, there we got you. Uh, because surely that's not in there. Oh, yes, it is. The plural form baptismois is used in a number of different places, particularly in Hebrews chapter 6 and in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10, and uh, on through verse 18. That whole section talks about the cleansing rituals of the Hebrew people. And it says that those cleansing rituals of the people and the priests where blood was sprinkled on them, and oil and water were sprinkled on them, it calls them baptisms, baptisms. So baptism is a word which is used referring to three different modes, immersion, pouring, and sprinkling. They're all deeply biblical. So there's no reason to despise any of them or reject any of them. What we do need to be clear about, however, is this last thing, and that's the message of baptism. Because baptism is an external and visible pledge by God. More often than not, people think that baptism is something we're saying. But baptism is first 
Something God is saying. God's voice is over the waters, Psalm 29. God speaks over the waters, Genesis 1. God calls out over the waters at Jesus' baptism, Matthew chapter 3. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. God is the one who forgives sin. God is the one who unites us to Christ. It is first and foremost not something we're saying. It's something that God is effectually saying. It's something that he is doing. Romans chapter 6 Verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Well, Paul goes on to develop that argument. And he says, if you're not slaves, in Romans chapter 8, then what are you? Sons. You're the children of the living God. And the Spirit is upon you. And the Spirit is within you. And you have a whole new life. The message of baptism is, first of all, from God. The message of baptism is God saying, you're mine. One of the ancient words, usage, usages of that, that, that Latin word sacramentum was a Roman soldier, and he had a tattoo on his arm. If you were part of the 13th Legion, you had a tattoo on your arm that identified you forever as part of the 13th Legion. And you know what they called that? That visible sign? They called it sacramentum, the sign. Baptism, that that you belong to another. When you get baptized, God is saying, you're mine. You go, well, I know some people who got baptized that didn't live much like it. Yeah, well, that doesn't mean that the baptism wasn't true. That just means they weren't faithful to it. If you see two people stand up and get married, the marriage is right. As soon as the minister says, I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may now kiss the bride. And they kiss. They came in one way. They leave with a new identity. Now, if the next day the husband wakes up and goes, you know, I don't feel too married. I don't really feel very married. What's what's the wife going to say? See that ring on your finger? Better act like it. Now, if he doesn't, does that mean he's not married? No. It just means he's not a very good husband. There are many people who have the sign that don't live in it. But that doesn't mean the sign isn't true. And it means that they're accountable. And I say to all of you this morning, if you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God is saying about you, you're mine. Well, it's my body. I can do with it what I want. No, it isn't. You were bought with a price. Body and soul, you belong to Jesus. And the name of the Holy Trinity is on your life. You belong to him. And if you're living for yourself instead of for Jesus, better get your rear end down here and repent at the end of this service. You don't even wait for just as I am. Get down here. You belong to him. Here's the second thing. You're baptized by the Spirit, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, into the body. So the second message of baptism is not only God saying you're mine, but the church saying you're one of us. Now we've lost sight of that. We've lost sight of that in the West. Because people get baptized all the time and people go, oh, it's no big deal. If it's an infant baptism, people go, oh, isn't that sweet? And if it's an adult baptism, people go, yeah, that's great, I guess, but it's not really that big a deal, is it? Well, try that in Tehran. Try that in Saudi Arabia. Try that in India. Try that in front of your family that you have to leave and the career you have to give up and the life you may literally forfeit. Because you publicly received water on your head or you were immersed in in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because baptism, listen, I can tell you right now, having been a missionary, listen carefully. People all the time say, oh yes, I believe in Jesus. And they say that all the time. But they've never really fully converted until they're what? Until they're baptized. Because when they get baptized, they are publicly, they're publicly being identified with the church of Jesus, with the body of Christ, and that can cost them their life. When you get baptized, the church is saying, you're part of us. God's saying, you're mine, and the church is saying, you're one of us. That's why I turn to you whenever we do a baptism, and I say, church, you're going to stand with these parents, you're going to pray with these parents, you're going to fulfill your vows to walk with these people, to help them raise this child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And beloved, this is why baptism is necessary for communion. In Exodus 12, 48, It says that no one could come to Passover unless they'd first been circumcised. 
Circumcision was the sign of the covenant that said, you can now come to the table. That's why whenever we have the Lord's table, I say, if you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you're a believer in Jesus, and you're not trusting in your righteousness, but in his, then come to the table. It's alarming to me that people, that people don't want to baptize their kids, but they do want them to come to the table. You want one sign of the covenant, but not the other. Please, give them both. They're part of the covenant community. The fact that you want them at the table shows that you know that intrinsically down in your heart. All we're saying, all the Bible is saying is wash before you eat. Come to the table, but be baptized. And so here's the truth. The message of baptism is this. God says you're mine. The church says you're one of us. And it's all because of the cross. Because Jesus said this about his cross. He said to people, can you have the baptism I'm about to undergo? The baptism? What was his baptism? The cross. And he went to the cross, and he died for us. He died as our substitute, and he bore our sins, and he carried them away. And then he was raised from the dead for us. And Jesus is saying to you, I'm offering you my life. The Savior is saying, I want to unite you to my life. I want you in me, and I want to be in you. My friend, how can you deny that to your, to your covenant children? Those of you who are thinking about getting baptized, why do you delay? There's no need to. And there's no need for those of you who wonder if it took to wonder anymore. God took it seriously. Let me tell you something about baptism. It's one and done. You don't need to get re-baptized. That's a great sin against God. I did it. I had to repent of it. God takes baptism seriously even if you didn't. And if it was ba- you were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it took. Rejoice in it. Give thanks for it. That was God saying, you're mine. And the church saying, you belong to us. And now, now live in the promise that was bestowed on you in those waters that said, when God said, you're not a slave anymore. You're not a slave anymore. Now you're my child. And if you need to get baptized, if you've never been baptized, I tell you what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. Repent, believe, be baptized. Wash away your sins. Join Delmar in the community of the beloved. Listen to what God said to Israel. You're not my people because you were bigger and better. You were the least of, of all. But I loved you and I kept my promise. I tell you this morning, my friends, God loves you. He kept his promise. And every time you see somebody baptized, it's God saying, there's my promise. There's my promise of cleansing through Jesus Christ. I tell all of you who are baptized this morning, I put you in remembrance, young and old, Jesus' blood is enough. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the sacrament of holy baptism. And we pray that for those, any of us, who are in need of holy baptism, that they would receive it. We pray, Lord, for for those who have been doubtful about their baptism to be renewed in it. For those who have been prodigals wandering away from the family name, that you would bring them home. And they would begin to live in the good of the promise you bestow on them when you said you're not slaves anymore, you're sons. And I thank you for that. Now, Father, I pray that as we go forward together as a church, we would always give thanks to you and see your voice thundering over the waters. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning and let's confess our faith together in the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. They put us in reminder as well of our baptism. Paul said there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's one and done. So let's say it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, He descended into hell. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Now, Lord, let your servants depart in peace according to your word, because our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel, even Jesus, your Son, who we confess together as Lord and Savior now and forever. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's sing and rejoice together as we go today. <laughs> 